resilient and robust metabolic characteristics of, of nutritional ketosis is you give the body the permission to burn at least twice as much fat as when they're not on a ketogenic diet. And that's whether they're at rest or exercise. And it clearly, one of the, fat, the, sat, the fats that the body prefers to burn when you give it permission to burn twice as much fat is saturated fat. It only hurts you if it builds up in your blood. If you're keto adapted, you can eat saturated fat. I won't say to abandon, but as a significant proportion of your fat coming from coconut oil, from animal fats, wherever, uh, and you will burn it for fuel, turn it into CO2 and water, and contribute to global warming. <laughs> but speaking about warming and inflammation, we measured 14 biomarkers, bioactive compounds, associated with inflammation in these patients. It was a three-month-long study, and <clears throat> of, the, of the 14, seven of them came down significantly in the group, great to a greater degree in the group on the ketogenic diet compared to the control diet. Interestingly, over on the right-hand side, those are the column, that, that, in that column was the things that didn't come down, and one was white blood cell count, and one was CRP. And it turns out that all things, all these different keys on the keyboard don't respond in lockstep in the early phases of keto adaptation. And C-reactive protein, in particular, is one of the slow responders. So I've seen multiple papers of people doing well-done ketogenic diet studies, and they measure see reactive protein and say, see, inflammation doesn't come down. It's like you know, running a really, really fast quarter mile, but you never, you never get the gold cup at the, at the one mile mark in a one mile race. You gotta run the whole race. It, it takes longer than, than three months for CRP to respond to <clears throat> this, this type of intervention. So cutting to the chase, most, more recently, the study we, we did with Dr. Sarah Hallberg in Indiana, we're now, we've completed five years, by the way, and she survived through the, the final rec um, uh, patient visits at the five-year time point. Um, and that was part of her commitment to, to this process. So we recruited 262 people. So focusing on the people with diabetes, um, they were about two-thirds female, average age 54, um, very overweight, average BMI was 41, had lots of weight to lose. Importantly, the average duration of time since diagnosis was over eight years. These are not, not new onset. The majority of them were on two or more drugs, um, metformin plus something else, and some of them were on multiple drugs. Had access to a coach and to a physician, in the case of the study, to Dr. Hallberg. On a continuous basis, seven days a week, they could, they could reach out through the app and get in contact with someone. They monitored their blood glucose and their blood ketones. They stood on the scale every day. I'll focus just on the two-year data. So this is a paper published uh, uh, in Frontiers of Endocrinology, and we presented it at Obesity Week in 2018, so it's not brand new. The blue line across the top shows retention in the study. And um, you can see at one year we had 83% retention uh, in the people with type 2 diabetes, and two years, 74% retention. Uh, and I'm not bragging. You can go look. Um, in lifestyle studies, maintaining half the people in a study at one year is considered good. And having this, this level of retention at two years is remarkable. And then the embedded graph there on the lower left-hand side shows the daily blood ketones in patients uh, over a one-year period of time, and you can see that uh, out to eight months on the, of that one-year time frame, the group mean value for beta-hydroxybutyrate was 0.5 millimolar. So people who tell you that patients can't maintain this, wrong. People can maintain it. You just have to give them permission to do it and proper information in terms of how to do it.